Okay, uh, just to kick things off, putting deep in your title twice is a really good way to get SIGGRAPH talks accepted. Um, the reality is this has 0% deep learning in it. Uh, so if you're looking for a pee break, now's a, a wonderful chance. Um, the other thing I'll say is I'm really here just on behalf of my team. Uh, everything I'm going to talk about is really the hard work and coding of two guys back in London, Fabia and Apple. Thank you so much. Sorry you couldn't be here. I'm going to give a really quick refresher on deep images. Uh, this came out of a seminal paper from Pixar back in, I think it was 2000, and they were looking for a better way of doing shadow maps. And their kind of key breakthrough was to say that actually an image doesn't only have to have a single color or a single value per pixel, you could store an array of values per pixel. Um, and in their case, and well, in our case as well, it represents different samples in depth. So effectively you're encoding X and Y in your image plane space and you have multiple samples in, in Z or Z. Um, so we'll take this kind of uh, Vancouver House Cat example here. This is what the 2D view of it would look like. But if we were to render this as a deep image, effectively what we would be uh, capturing is all of the samples in depth that the camera saw. So this is basically kind of a, a sort of like a point cloud representation of everything that the camera saw. Uh, when we do our path tracing, we'll typically send somewhere between 200 and 2,000 samples per pixel. Uh, so there's a lot of geometry that uh, gets hit by one of those rays, particularly in like a furry creature setting. Uh, so that kind of leads into a little bit of a spoiler to, okay, what's the problem? So let's consider this example here, and I'll call this the grassy plain of doom. If we render this as a deep image, it's about 50 megs in size. Um, and I should be honest and say that this is actually half res from our normal production settings. So I don't want to necessarily say that it would turn into 200 megs, uh, but a full production resolution version of this grassy plane of doom would certainly be much more than 50 megabytes in size. By itself, 50 megabytes is semi-wranglable, um, the problem is that we don't render still images. We are a visual effects company that produces shots for Hollywood feature film. Uh, so what that means is that we're rendering in stereo most of the time. Our average shot count is about 100 frames in length, and we are typically bidding on shows where it's 1,000 plus shots for a film. Um, I tried to do some quick mental math and lost track of the zeros, but it's, it's a lot of data. Um, and the problem for us in particular is that we are very heavily invested in being a multi-site company. We very rarely process all of the data from beginning to end in one part of the world. We're routinely generating data in, say, Vancouver, and then need to process it in Bangalore, which is pretty far away, uh, which means it takes a little while for all those little bits to get across the wire and through the ocean and however it works. I'm, I'm not a sinking guy. Um, but this is kind of a pretty representative view of what our sinking guys go through uh, when we tell them kind of what our data forecast is going to be when we start to round uh, when we start to do that math and figure out how many zeros it's going to be. Okay, so back to the grassy plane of doom. Uh, let's focus on this little pixel here outlined in white. And again, it's, this is a deep pixel. It's not just a color. It is a series of colors in depth. Um, in particular, it was 38 um, samples in depth. So what that means is actually this tiny little rectangle on screen here there are 38, at least 38 different blades of grass that you can, you can see through that little rectangle. Um, and when you fire close to 2,000 rays, they will find them. Uh, and here they all are. So that seems like a lot, uh, particularly if we consider this is a fairly background pixel. Um, there's probably not going to be the predominant part of the shot. So what do we care about? Like out of these 38 samples, how many do we care about? And in particular, why do we care about them? The two main reasons that we render deep images at all is for content integration and for further image processing. So speaking about those very quickly, for content integration, our scenes are typically too heavy to render the entire thing in one go. We'll chop them up into different elements. So that was the grassy plane of doom. There's probably gonna be some creature that's stomping through it. Uh, maybe that creature is kicking up a dust cloud. Uh, maybe there's another tree as well. And we'll render them all on different layers. Uh, and then we need to composite them together. And simple depth compositing doesn't work for us with anti-aliasing and edge issues and whatnot. We need kind of that deep, uh, those deep files so we can kind of composite anywhere in there. And the second is for image processing. We tend to do a lot of our depth of field as a post-process. It's very expensive to do it in the render. 
and we find that uh, our clients like to change their mind about what should and shouldn't be in focus very, very, very late in the day. Um, and the idea of constantly going back to re-render just to change which blade of grass should or shouldn't be in focus is prohibitively expensive. So we allow them to delay their decision by pushing it further into the pipeline, pushing it down into a compositing decision. But again, to apply that effect in compositing, we need that rich 3D content in our 2D application. I, I guess you could argue Nuke is actually a 3D application in many ways now. So this problem is not entirely new. Um, if we go back to the Deep Shadow Maps paper, they also realized that maybe there's more data that comes out of the renderer than you actually technically need. And they propose a whole section on how to do compression, how to effectively throw away samples. So we drew some inspiration from this. And if we look at the evolution of uh, deep images from the original Deep Shadow Map paper to where we are now, uh, where you can now represent colors and all kinds of stuff, one of the interesting additions in recent years is the notion of volumetric samples. So not only do you have kind of very discrete points as to um, something was hit at this specific depth, but basically you can specify ranges. So with a single sample, you can say that from here to here, transparency goes down by a certain amount. And it's well described in the OpenEXR literature how that math is, takes place. But out of the renderer, we're not getting that. We're only getting these very discrete point samples. So going back to this, we're only getting these 38 discrete samples as to where there were grass blades. And conceptually, we can probably think more about this as being a grass volume. We probably don't care about every single grass blade intersection. But we do care that until the first grass blade, we have full visibility. And behind the very last grass blade, we have no visibility. Everything's completely blocked off. But then between the two, there's kind of that slower fade, and we probably don't care about all 38 little events. So what can we group together? How, how do we decide what's meaningful or not? I mean, the, the spacing between these ones feels pretty close. I mean, we're talking about millimeters between grass blades here at a depth of, oh, I should say these units here are in decimeters. So this is like five and a half meters out. Um, we probably don't care about grass blades that are millimeters apart. <coughs> But further out, the grass blades are further apart. Do we care about these distances? It starts to become a pretty subjective metric. Um, similarly here, and they're kind of spread in a way that is not immediately obvious. One of the uh, things that we decided to think about a bit is that maybe this distance is actually not a kind of uniform thing. We shouldn't be just thinking about how far away are objects, but how far away are they relative to the camera? Um, if I think about the audience members here in the front, if I put kind of just two fingers in front of each other, people in the front can probably say without a moment's hesitation, like, ah, oh, I can see which finger was in front of the other one. The people in the very, very back probably missed it. So our intuition is that we shouldn't think about depth linearly, but we should think about depth more logarithmically, and we should be adjusting our samples appropriately. And now at this point, kind of those front cluster grass blades and the back cluster grass blades, glass, grass blades, sorry, uh, we can think that perceptually they have about the same amount of impact. So if we're going to cluster one, we can cluster the other. And that's what we go about doing. We kind of pick some threshold, some artist-defined threshold as to what is close enough, and we kind of say that in a perceptual way, like what's perceptually close enough. And then we just lump them together and we convert all of those point samples into volumetric samples. So in this case, we went from 32 to 8, um, yeah, 30, 38 to 8, something like that. And we reduced the image from 50 megs to 20 megs, which is still insanely large, but it's less than half. I mean, this is already a huge, huge, huge start. And if we bring this into uh, Nuke for further processing, I mentioned that depth of field is one of the things that we like to do. Um, so here's our depth of field running on the original image. Here it is running on the reduced image. And I'm pretty sure you can't tell the difference. I couldn't find a single pixel that was different. Um, I tried to do a diff image and blow it up like a thousand times just to demonstrate something. Um, but it was, it was really hard to see. And that suggests actually that probably we could have been even more aggressive. Uh, changing the focus completely, so focusing on a different part of the image, again, in the original, the reduced. Uh, I mentioned we could, probably could have been more aggressive, so again, this is unlikely to be the dominant part of the shot, so we probably don't even need this many clusters. We probably could have gone down to this many clusters. Maybe we could have gone down to one even. Um, but we allow this to be an artistically controlled metric, and it sits kind of pretty late in the pipeline, which, which is nice, because it allows us to experiment a little bit without any kind of costly uh, re-rendering hit.
So the next uh, kind of thought we had is like, okay, there are different ways that we can think about depth and how important, um, how important different samples are. So we talked about kind of a logarithmic uh, manipulation of space. The next was to think about this depth of field post-processing and to imagine that samples that are in focus are probably pretty important and samples that are super, super blurry, probably not so important. Um, I wear glasses. If certainly if I was to take off my glasses and do this experiment, I definitely would not be able to tell you which finger was in front. So in this case, we're kind of focusing right on the more, on the mid ground of this grassy plain of doom. And what we do then is we basically stretch space again. So we say that it's really important to maintain detail. We kind of apply this weighting so that wherever the in-focus part of your scene is, we say there's huge amounts of importance here. And as it gets blurrier and blurrier and blurrier, we say, ah, probably less important. Which means that again, kind of if we define a perceptual range for what we're willing to compress into a single sample, you can see that it has huge amounts of impact in the very blurry regions, kind of the very, very foreground and the very, very background. We can be incredibly aggressive in terms of what we compress. But in that in, uh, in focus region, we have to be very conservative and not blend together a whole bunch of grass blades where we might actually see that uh, suddenly we're getting an incorrect result later on. So that's all about image processing. I mentioned that the other thing that we tend to do with deep images is object merging. So let's imagine that we've rendered three different uh, elements independently. Uh, I apologize, that cat should have a transparent background. Um, so we've rendered these two trees and this cat, and this is probably also not gonna work with a transparent background. Oh, it does, good. Uh, and then we're gonna slap them all together. And we're gonna do some deep compositing to ensure that everything kind of nicely interleaves. So, do we care about all of those deep samples? I mean, similar to the grassy plain of doom, these leaves, a lot of subpixel detail, there's gonna be just loads and loads and loads of data, which is going to go back to our sad kitten face for our data wranglers. What we do is to, after those images have come out of the renderer, is we take the bounding box and we start to look for overlaps to identify kind of areas that we actually care about having detail in and areas that we don't. So there are kind of three patches right off the bat where there is no overlap between elements. And if we're not gonna do any further depth-based um, compositing, pardon me, like image processing for depth of field and things like that, we know that all of these samples are, are for naught. Like we, we just don't care, we're not gonna use this stuff anymore. We can just flatten this. And finding the, these regions is super, super cheap. Like doing bounding box intersections is, is free. And then we can go and kind of compress all of those pixels, which is fantastic. Like huge savings right off the bat right there. Then we go back to the image and we look for areas where there is still some overlap. So in this case, we've got the mountain lion sitting on top of this background tree here. And we can go pixel by pixel, which is fairly quickly, and just look at where those samples are in depth. And we can look in particular for overlap. So again, it's a pretty cheap operation, not to iterate over all the samples, but just to say what's the closest furthest sample for this element, say the mountain cat, and the furthest and closest sample for the background tree. And we can see that there's no overlap in these ranges here. So again, all of that detail is, is for naught. We don't care about it. So we can collapse all of that into, again, a single volume sample for this pixel. Uh, where these two trees start to overlap, yeah, that's a problem. We do have to maintain that detail there. Uh, so, we, so we keep it. That's nice and simple. Um, but it kind of outlines how very quickly and very cheaply we can identify regions where we can just start to throw away data very quickly um, and really, really bring down the file sizes. And we have to do this as a post-process. Um, everything I've presented here, it's not particularly academic, uh, but it's kind of a practical uh, kind of next step from what we get out of our rendering software. We don't write our own, we use commercial software for that. And ultimately, we know more than the renderer does. We're asking it to render a tree, then we're asking it to render another tree, and then we ask it to render a mountain lion. And at no point do we have the ability to tell the renderer, these are all gonna be composited together in this certain way. But that doesn't mean that we have to accept that full hit of that enormous data set that the renderer gives us. We can compress it quite aggressively before actually passing it on to other artists to use, and of course, before syncing it around the world. Um, so this is actually in many ways just the start of some investigation. Uh, we're very curious to see what other metrics we could apply to these kind of compression algorithms. And mostly I hope to hear some thoughts from you. So thank you for your attention. So um, 
you, you mentioned the ability for the artist to sort of uh, have a certain amount of control over how, I don't know, how dense the area of depth is, I guess you might say. Yeah. Uh, what, what does that control look like? Do they give weights to, the, to certain ranges of distance or uh, uh, how, how does that work? Yeah, so in the, in the submission for this, there's actually a little bit of math, which I chose to leave off the slides because I know it's the last day and everyone, including myself, is quite tired. Um, we kind of tried to model a general formula that could be used to shape the space, uh, which had about four parameters, uh, kind of like an exponent and then kind of a scalar and an offset and things like that. And in observing the compositors working, we found that they were only ever playing with one of those four. So we basically just dropped it all and just changed it to a multiplier. So like in the, in the depth-based one, it's just a straight multiplier that you would say kind of at depth one, I care about this level of detail and it just kind of multiplies outwards. So depth 10, it's 10 times that, that threshold. Okay. We kept it super simple because I think four parameters was too much. They weren't using them and they got confused as to what they meant. No, no, that, that's, that, that's, yeah, that's interesting. I was kind of what I was wondering about if there was, if sort of giving them infinite control was maybe not, you know, kind of not worth it. Yeah, giving them four was three too many. Okay. Uh, any any other any other questions? I didn't see anybody standing up. I want to give you the opportunity. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, just trying to understand the workflow. So, as you said, this is a post process. So, really, there is no disk space savage anywhere. Right? No savings on disk space because, like, you are still keeping your depth uh, depth images like with the information. Correct. So, there's no disk savings initially. Um, the benefit is that we can start to treat those enormously heavy files, which previously would have ended up in our asset management system and synced around the world. We can treat those as temporary artifacts. Um, and then do our compression, throw away that heavy mess, and now we've got something very lightweight that we can pass around and keep. So, so just to be clear, this is kind of a pre-processing before the compositing? Yeah, okay. that's, a, that's a perfect way to think about it. Got it. Hey, I was just curious, uh, how heavy is that pre-processing? Like, is it... Uh, quite CPU intensive to do that pre-processing, or how fast is it? Yeah, I mean, it, it definitely maxes out the CPUs, but uh, it's pretty fast. I have well under a minute a frame, okay. well under. Well, you couldn't keep it as an interactive thing within uh, the UI? Um, at full resolution, I think you'd be pushing your luck. It's, it's at a minimum seconds per frame. Do you, do you give the control to who sets the thresholds, the lighter, or do you give that control to the compositor if they choose? So we give it to compositing, um, at least to set up, and then we try and find a ideally per show threshold that we want to use. Uh, worst case per sequence is kind of our starting point. Um, ideally people aren't touching it too much after that. And uh, the data that you throw away, do you have it so that it falls off, or do you just truncate <coughs> it after a certain value? Uh, in any of the example, any, any example the in particular? So the deep, so say the area of overlap between the two trees is ah, from here yeah. to here, do you slowly fall off after that, or do you just so truncate this, after the? Yeah, so in this section? kind of example here, no, we just did hard cutting. Um, I should mention this one actually rarely gets used in practice, despite the fact that it does have tremendous potential for throwing away data. Um, people are always very nervous about the fact that it's like, actually, we might want to integrate another element that we didn't know about. And if you've just thrown away all the depth data, then you're, you're kind of screwed. Uh, so yeah, while this one, in theory, has the most promise, is the one we use the least often. Hey, how do you make the artists care about applying the filters? Like, if, <laughs> if, if it's an optional uh, thing that they can apply, uh, they might just not do it because they don't care about this space, right? Yes, so very, thankfully there is actually a side benefit to this, which is that a lot of Nuke's deep processing nodes uh, slow down based on the number of deep samples that they're processing. Uh, so as the artists are compressing these things more and more and more and effectively reducing the number of deep samples in the image, uh, their Nuke scripts start running faster and faster and faster. Uh, so it's actually in their best interest to uh, get the best possible result out of this. Otherwise, like, yeah, it's, it's tricky. Okay, thank you. Let's thank Rob one more time, thanks.